It's the KSO Show. I'm Derek Young, joined by Grant Flanders. You'll hear him in just a sec because we're talking basketball, and that's kind of his wheelhouse on KSO. KSO Show is brought to you by us, (laughs) just us. And we're going to talk basketball, like I said, wrapping up the season. Just a recap on the season. They uh, give us the numbers in terms of record, Flando. I know they won Four, four and fourteen. Four in and fourteen. Play. Play twelve. They've got through all of their conference games, which all whoever did not think would happen. Yep, yep. to begin the year. Got you good, Bruce. We got all eighteen in. One <laughs> only that? one had to be rescheduled. It was the Iowa State game. Eight and eighteen overall. Is it? You tell me. I think it's eight and eighteen eight overall. 18? I can check real yeah, quick. Yeah, double check. And a sweep over the Cyclones, who finish the Big Twelve slate. Eight and nineteen overall. Eight and nineteen. Sorry, should... Not twenty losses. Avoided that. Yeah. yeah. Well. 20th loss could be in Kansas City. Yeah. Let's not, true. let's pretend they go undefeated and win it all. <laughs> um, the Cyclones go 0 and 18 after Kansas State completes the sweep of them in uh, Brave Lynch yep. Coliseum. That was the last game. We'll touch on that briefly. Uh, I guess w- w- what kind of paved the way for the Wildcats to complete the sweep? I know Iowa State's not good, but there's a five point win. There's a five point win. Uh, which isn't great in the grand scheme because Rasir Bolton, who's probably their best player, was also out with injury. He was for the last two games <laughs> yeah. of the season. So, I mean, the win's a win. It's really good that they got that win, especially because Rasir Bolton was out. Should have been more convincing. But it should have been more convincing. Without Rasir Bolton, Nigel Pack was back in the lineup. So the Bradford offense, in foul trouble again. Bradford was in foul trouble. And that was a big reason why I think you know they weren't able to put away Iowa yeah. State. But Solomon Young's a pretty good team. defensive big. He so, is. Yeah. He's pretty solid. Iowa State's not known for defense, but he can play. Well, yeah, he yeah. can. And, I mean, they're a scrappy good team. They played tough all season long. Iowa State did, even through all, I mean, yeah, they, they, 17 they actually, losses. Despite the, the them going 0-18 in the league, they were actually more competitive most of the year than yeah. Kansas State was. Absolutely. They, they and, well, I was thinking of TCU for a second. <laughs> but they but they did play some top-notch competition in the Big 12. Even Baylor, they they – the last game with Baylor, it was after that twenty-day layoff. Yeah, but, but they, they, they were they were leading in the yeah, second half, and they only won by like five points. So it's amazing that they went zero and eighteen because they were actually more competitive than the Cats. Yeah, and they still went zero and eighteen. Yep. And the Cats, and, Cats and, were not. I mean, kids, they almost went ten straight games by losing by double digits, and somehow they still found four yeah. wins. So, it's well, all, and it, that's the thing: is Iowa State should have beat K State if we're being honest. Yeah, at but, least once. Yeah, at least once. They should have couldn't do it. Should have beat TCU at, yeah, least, at once. least once. And and then you know, luck into beating another team. It's actually more surprising to me that Iowa State didn't win a game. Oh, here, I'll, I'll put it this, frame it this way. It's a question. Are you more surprised that Iowa State didn't win a game or more surprised that Kansas State won four? More surprised that Iowa State didn't win one. That's that's easy one for me, too. Because, well, I, it depends on where you're they at. They had so many because close before games. Before the season, four, four wins, we were saying they could win five or six possibly this yeah. season. But during that stretch, we were thinking, yeah, wow, I mean, State it, might not win a yeah. game. Iowa State's probably going to beat them when they play eventually. Still, still surprising they can't stay one four. It was. But even, it, even looking back yep. on it. But I think even looking back on it, it's more surprising than Iowa State won I zero agree. because they came close so many times. And, yeah, they should have beat K-State at least once because this was a K-State team where – then they have they almost, everyone should have at least beat once. Was it Texas Tech they almost beat too? I think. I mean, Iowa State came close. It's uh, Iowa State came close to a lot more times than K State. The best K State game had for a loss was Texas, where they lost by three. Besides that, I think their closest loss outside of that may be TCU by seven. And uh, the Cyclones, we should probably say they did have some bad luck with COVID there for a minute, and they had quite a layoff, I believe, as well. Mm-hmm. Had to reschedule three or four Big Twelve games, and I think that, it might have been this last week. Where I was stayed to play four games, yep. I think. So I mean, they, they yeah, they, they, and that they, was another thing because they they were coming off the case to the K State game. They were coming off of three games that week. Already. Yeah, so, they were playing every other day. So <laughs> that yeah, that obviously must have been difficult. And K State probably could have been more convincing, but they got the win. They got the four wins, um, which is one more conference win than that team last year was able to do. Which you know is some progress for sure. Winning three out of the last four games. Um, and hopefully they can, you know, carry this into an exciting Big 12 tournament where I look back, they, they've they faced TCU now for four straight Big 12 tournaments as their first opponent. TCU's had playing games before yeah. and played other people before, but K-State's first opponent every time for the last four years in the Big 12 tournament, TCU, like how? How many years, or what was the record in those prior three games? I know last year was a win. What about, I think 19 must have won a win too. Uh, it might be 3-0, and right? They didn't lose their first game. They won last year. 2019 was two years ago, and yeah. they 
They won the. That would have been the Big 12 they championship They won that year. game. Yeah, because that was the game where TCU played a t- playing game with Oklahoma State to play K-State. Yeah. K-State, so K-State was State the won. number one seed. So going off two straight wins, what about three? Was the year they went to the Elite Eight? Did they beat TCU? It was the Elite Eight year. Big 12 tournament. I I just looked this stuff up yesterday. Yeah. I should be able so to. So it's the first game they played. They TCU. did beat TCU. So, so this could, 60, 60, so if they, are, if they were to knock off the Horned Frogs on Wednesday evening, it would be the fourth year in a row where they have eliminated Jamie Dixon's club. Yeah. So some built yeah, some yeah. built in inspiration for the Frogs. <laughs> uh, before we get into the Big 12 tournament, let's fade back a little mm-hmm. bit to the regular season. We just talked about the Iowa State game. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you describe the season? It was. I guess the only way to describe it would be to say that they started out incredibly slow. They looked like a very putrid club mm-hmm. and for probably the first 80% of the season, yeah. to be quite honest. And I think 80% is about right. And I mean, this is a team that lost to Fort Hay State. This is a team that barely beat Omaha, which was their, old, their most recent win for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, lost by almost 50 to Baylor. Lost almost by 50 to Baylor. <laughs> they... I mean, not looking back on it now, they were competitive against Drake, which isn't a bad thing. I don't, the mm-hmm. funny because those first two games were pretty solid Colorado against Drake, Drake and Colorado. They play, they came out like I didn't expect. I thought I expected. This I remember game to be the, yeah, in the beginning of that Colorado game, they were actually they might have been some of their best basketball. Yeah, year. I remember they got out to a pretty significant lead, yep. only to blow it. But yeah, first eighty percent of the season, pretty rough. Um, you would not imagine the twenty per, last twenty percent being what it is if you knew what the eighty percent was. That included, like we said, a Fort Hay State loss by thirteen, a fifty point loss to Baylor, almost fifty, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, thirteen consecutive conference losses, most of which were by double digits. Um, that first eighty percent was pretty rough. Yeah, I mean, and it just shows the resiliency because I've said it many times. I'd gi- I'd given up. I would have given up <laughs> during that thirteen game losing you would, streak. You would have given up after Omaha. <laughs> yeah, like, ah, well. Omaha, my two to Omaha. Just mail it in because I, mean, I I was I was giving up. I was thinking that this team's easily only going to win one conference. Yeah, because I season. yeah I thought Iowa State early in the year. Yeah, I thought it was going to be one in seventeen. I thought they were going to get swept by TCU. I yeah. thought they they would lose the. The return game with yep. the Cyclones because there's no way they be, beat Oklahoma. So then, even after they beat yeah. TCU, I was like, "There's no way." They yeah, beat pl- pl- and plus Oklahoma was playing good ball oh, for yeah. a while. No one thought that they beat the Sooners. No one thought that they would. I That's guess what, we thought a winning against Iowa State and TCU was maybe realistic, but at the same time, we still expected losses yeah. because Iowa State was remaining competitive, mm-hmm. and, and TCU they swept Oklahoma State. Yep. So. Yeah. It's weird, man. It is. It's a weird season. I would say it's poor. It's a poor season. There's Still no poor way to put it. Better than last season a better, somehow, a, though, a, as far as how they finished. But as a whole, yeah. this season, yeah, like you said, eighty percent was pretty. Bad. They still had one more, one more conference win than last year. Still felt like last year's team was better, but since they went three and fifteen, last year's team was such an under. That's where Bruce Weber screwed up the most. Yeah, yeah. This year was pretty ugly, especially in the beginning. But they really screwed up. By how they underachieved so much last year, that's not a three and fifteen Big Twelve team. Um, should have done far yeah. greater, which is why, you know, Weber. If you want to say hot seat, hot water, whatever it is, he's in the position he is. Not because of what they did this yeah. year. You know, this year was historically there bad was, yeah, in there part. Was blowouts. There was a longer losing streak this year, but but you still tolerated a little bit, especially with the way you finished. If you didn't underachieve so dramatically exactly. last year, and it was all because of losses. All they had to do was win a few more games last year. But they, they had, it was like Iowa State this year. They were competitive with a lot of teams throughout, but then they would let things go in the last four minutes of many games. And yeah. Weber brought that up. And then some personnel and roster issues that we still Absolutely. take issue with. Um, uh-huh. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but they really, once seasons are finished and they try to they manage the roster, they seem to make some errors each time. It's not one of their strong points. No, it's not. Um, and that's something that they're going to have to flip this season. Mm-hmm. If they do are indeed, you know, back for another season next year, they're going to have to flip that and make sure this off season's one where yeah. they hit on guys in the transfer portal and make sure they don't, uh, I should, shouldn't say push out, but let guys go on their specific team that they actually think there's hope for the future. Yeah. Cause if they run it back with Something similar. I can see maybe a couple more wins, but it's not going to be anything significant to the point. I guess I say that the Weber should feel comfortable in his job security, yeah. assuming that he's back next year, which, you know, I don't know is a certainty. It, you know, it gets a little 
more uncertain by the day of what direction they'll go in. Obviously, some of it's going to be Bruce Weber's decision as and well. And get on the message board. Yeah, you, you can the, there's all, yeah. there's stuff going on. So, um, I would say that if assuming that he is back, in which maybe we shouldn't assume that, but let's hypothetically say that he is. Yeah. I don't think you can run it back with an identical roster. You run it back with an identical roster, I think you still improve just because some players are just going to get better. That's mm-hmm. what players do. But I don't think you're improving significantly enough to where you feel comfortable in your, in your position because you have you haven't come close to the instant way tournament now two years in a row. Mm-hmm. A third would be problematic for me. Um, me too. You have to at least be on the bubble next mm-hmm. year. And I don't think you can do it with this identical roster. And I, I've agreed that same way, yeah. you know, throughout on the message boards and whatever. When I'm talking about this, I agree. I don't know how you bring the same exact roster back and expect to be into the NCAA tournament. I could maybe see them bubble, at, you know, a ceiling, ceiling at best. This identical roster to this year for next year would be, you know, bubble, bubble team at best. At with the this very one, best, uh, with which this would be one, seven, I think, eight wins in conference. I think play. it's six or seven with this one. I think you need a transfer to get to that bubble. Yeah, an impact okay. transfer. Yeah, no, I and I can totally agree with that side of the things too. I do think that this team, obviously, yeah, you get some more wins. Guys are going to get better. I think even Mike McGurl can even get better. I would but agree. I just don't know if he can be the consistent guy that they would need him to be because he would have to be the the catalyst as a transfer, you know, quote unquote transfer, but he's coming back in for his, you know, another year and he'd have to be much better. Oh, no, I would agree with that. My problem with getting to the bubble with just this team, like you're saying is I don't think they have enough depth at the bottom of the roster because I think what you're, you're asking for would be then significant improvement from someone yeah. like Carlton Lingard or Siri Lewis, mm-hmm. which I don't think that they can get maybe Lucas Suki, which I, he'll be more ready next year, but I don't think he's good enough to get them to yeah. the bubble. We don't know the stats of Antonio Gordon. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's now, up, that's that, one that like, yeah, he's and, not here next yeah year. and that's now in doubt. So I think with this roster, it's going to be tough for you for it to get to the bubble. Like you're prognosticating because it just, there's not enough quality depth there well, to get there. And you throw out Antonio Gordon. I mean, you you can you know get a better idea of what's happening on the message board again, but you know things are are evolving and and he might not be back next season. Yeah, and that's another thing right there. He's not you know the greatest player on this team. He's but not he, losing but him would. Uh, he's not, not the good. greatest player on this team, but that tells you where the depth is at. That if you're going to have the depth to maybe get to the bubble, that you might need him. But I I guess we can fair to say this: there is. Definite doubt as to whether Antonio Gordon will be back next year. Yeah. Definite it, doubt. We can't confirm whether yeah. he's gone or staying or whatever, but the tea leaves and the momentum and the trajectory of what is transpiring would certainly suggest that it's quite possible he's not in Manhattan next year. Which I know it's kind of sad to say because we just talked about on a podcast recently about how they stack too many bigs on the roster. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, he's it's one sad of to ones. see because he's one of the better ones. Which is which is not something. even that great. Which. Yeah. It's too bad that they stack up on bigs if that we, usually aren't that Big 12 caliber. Players. Right, and I guess we wouldn't feel as pessimistic about it if we thought that they were capable of adding someone as quality or better than Antonio Gordon in the offseason. Then we wouldn't feel as badly yeah. as we do about it because he's not a world beater by any means. But that just kind of shows you the confidence of what we're accustomed to yeah. with Bruce Weber. Not trying to cut him down on his knees right here, but typically – in the off season, right after the season's finished, upgrading is not something where you no. really see his best ads are early. I agree. Yeah, no, that's that's no doubt about that. Um, and usually he likes to go the JUCO transfer route, which I don't late. love. Yeah, you know, late and with the, David which Sloan, he did with Austin Casey Trice, Ziagu, Austin Trice, you know, McCall Maween. But that was not McCall a bad Maween. one. That wasn't a is bad that, one. But that, that one took one? a while to cultivate. Because and he was at a. Uh, a high major before Utah Juco. and then he went to Juco and then came to K-State and he took a, a year or two to really come into I mean really a year I would say and he was still a, and he was still a very below average offensive player exactly. his senior year yeah he was, he was just a good defensive defender. player yeah. but that's the thing is they and, and that's the thing is he would fit on this team great but that's they have a guy in Casey if Casey can become a better I, and, I, and I'm okay, and I'm okay, and I'm okay with Diego staying if he's just a backup rim defender. Yeah, which that's yeah. what they've made him into at yeah. the end of the season, which is good because Bradford's shown he's in, you know an offensive, going to be an offensive star um, at the center position, at the seven foot center position. So 
I like what they're doing with that. But yeah, if AG is truly gone, that's something they will have to fill in the offseason with with uh, more than likely an experienced big, another experienced big that can score. That can score, and you might want to let even a few more of the bigs that aren't doing much go, so you can still add some guards to help. Yeah, I would agree with that. Team. And you might want to grab a re. I guess you know you need Bradford and Easy to become better rebounders yeah. because, as well as Bradford flashed this year, and as well as Easy Ego protects the rim, not really the scorer, obviously. I would say those two are not great rebounders for as big as they are. No, they're not. They're not quick enough. That's the thing. The Big 12, you you the, you have to see a better rebounder in Dejuan Gordon and Antonio Gordon as smaller, slimmer guys mm-hmm. because they are able to have more effort. And that's another thing you lose with AG if he's not here next season is your him and uh, Dejuan Gordon are the biggest energy rebounding guys on the team. AG is probably the best rebounder on the team. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if that's a really a question. Yeah. I think that's probably a slam dunk. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll we'll flip the page. Last part of this because um, we don't we're not going to do super lengthy podcast because I know not everyone has the attention span for that. And we're coming to a close basketball season. Up next, Big Twelve tournament. Like we said, fourth game in a year, fourth year in a row where they they're going to open up with the TCU Horn Frogs. I'll just put it the put it this way to you. I don't know why I can't talk. <laughs> Do they go four and zero? Four in a row against the frogs? Oh, they can say four four in a row in the Big Twelve tournament. Oh that, <laughs> no, that, that's the next question. <laughs> After you tell me that they're going to beat Jamie Dixon for the fourth year yes. in a row, so that the BTCU that would make them I'm two in a four point win over TCU. In the a four first point round. win for the fourth year in a row, although not four points every yeah. year, and it would make them two and one against the frogs this year. Yeah, and that's that's I mean good news for them because that I think can make them look like. You know, more like the eighth best team instead of the ninth best team. That kind of solidifies it, right? Because they beat TCU twice, and TCU would, I mean, not in the actual standings, but in our minds, K State would be, yeah, would be the better team. It's the rubber match. And, and, I, and, and, and to be honest, I would pick K State in this one too. Not, I don't know if they're actually a better team. They might be now. I don't know that TCU. All they have to really, their name is a, a sweep of Oklahoma State. That's mm-hmm. probably the best thing they did all year. Yep. But. They have Mikey Miles, mm-hmm. who's probably their best player. He's yep. young, yep. so maybe they have a future there. Uh, Kevin Samuel, so maybe they mm-hmm. can take a step forward next season. But right now, I don't know that there is a clear difference between these two teams, and I think K-State's probably the more confident one because they've had more reasons to become upbeat in the yep. last month. And, I mean, that's the thing is Mike Miles, as good as Mike Miles has been, um, can't play D. He can't play D, and neither can Nigel Pack. But that's the guy I'm about to talk about. Nigel Pack. They're just they're both going to go for thirty. Yeah, <laughs> I almost trust Nigel Pack more offensively because first of all, he's getting asked to do more in the K State offense than uh, than Mike Miles is in the TCU offense. He's used a lot and he's used well. But RJ Nemhard's that number one guy, and they know that. Whereas now Nigel Pack's been oh, given the keys about RJ. to the offense. He's a senior, right? He's a junior, or senior. He's a, he's could a, be back. Yeah. We'll have to figure that out. RJ Nimhard score also not a, this is not a great defending team. Yep. TCU. Yep. So. Kevin Samuels is their only Defend. hope down there, and Daniel Bradford's done well against him. He's not super. Af- not a super athlete. No. Yeah. So I heard Fran Fraschilla say recently, or saw it on a Kellis Robinette article that uh, Fran did with Kellis. Um, Fran thinks that. Uh, why am I losing my? <laughs> What was I saying? Golly. But Bradford Samuel? Bradford. Oh, yeah. He called Bradford the offensive version of Kevin Samuel. Because Kevin Samuel is known That's for That's interesting. Because I don't know if he's A long time ago. Uh, yeah, you... I was going to say, when we first saw Davion Bradford get extended action, uh-huh. and you can vouch for this. And yeah. I think I've wrote it a couple times, yep. too. Davion Bradford reminds me of Kevin Samuel. Mm-hmm. Um, similar the, builds. Sim- big similar dudes. builds. And this is saying so, something but... about Bradford a little bit. Samuel is still probably a little bit better of an athlete. Bradford's running style is he doesn't really run, he scoots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like gliding. It's like he, he like scoots. He doesn't really pick his legs up. Mm-hmm. He just like moves. Yep. But uh, no, they're similar. Um, the, the way similar they move. Similar stature. Similar but the, stature. The different kind of Bradford's, Bradford's probably a little bit more skilled on the offensive. That's end. what. That's exactly what. Yeah. Fran for sure was saying that they're. They're opposites of each other as far as one's defensive-minded, one's offensive-minded, but same build, body. And I think I would take Bradford in that scenario because I, I trust to maybe get some defense out of him. 
to build skills a little bit harder, I oh, think. Because defense, defense is more of an effort thing. Mm-hmm. If you have effort, you can at least become an average defender or an above average defender yep. just based on effort alone. Just like Nigel Pack is, is improved as a defender. Still easy to score on, but if the effort's there, he makes it tougher. That's the thing with Bradford. If the effort is there, he can still make it tough on you just by being as big as he is and the body that he is. Building skill is a little bit more complicated because that is a little bit more of a finer asset to build. And that's why Kevin Samuel hasn't really? progressed no, that's why he's, a he's, bunch. He's basically, he almost looks like he's regressed when it's really just been kind same, of on par. He's, yeah, the he's, same player he, he hasn't as really he was changed. a freshman. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Which he, with Bradford, when he's a junior, we could be seeing an offensive juggernaut by then. I mean. Yeah, if because he can continue to expand. It, it does. Will his offensive game change a whole lot? Probably not. Probably not significantly because I don't think he's going to add range or anything. No, but he can add better he, post moves. He, he and can, just, he just can, get better done. He can just become more diversified in terms mm-hmm. of how he can beat someone, uh, find better ways, more ways to beat you, um, maybe go to the left more than the right because mm-hmm. he will go to the right almost every yep. time, develop more, more of a – I guess be more efficient with mm-hmm. his little baby hook. Yeah. Because right now he's just a dunker, and when he has, when he doesn't dunk, not as efficient near the rim. Yep. You know, bounce it around. But he's never going to – I mean, I don't think his range is even going to become eight feet. No, I don't <laughs> think so. But the foundation of what he is supposed to be is really exciting. Seven-footer, down low, has good skill down there already. He dunks the ball. That's something that K-State's missed out of – I'll say it, Mac Maywin didn't dunk the ball nearly as much – in one season that I've even seen Davion Bradford doing his freshman year. So that's mm-hmm. exciting. Better hands as well. Strong hands. That's something that both Bradford and Isiagu have over Mac. The only thing Mac ever had over either of these players, really, is just really incredible at defending the pick and roll. Yeah. He actually, and I'm not going to slam Mac a little bit, but he was really good at defending the pick and roll. But he wasn't great at defending one on one. That was the no, funny he thing. Was he was just, just a hedger. He was just a hedger, <laughs> and and that's something you know Weber <laughs> values a lot. Yeah, because that, that, that's, that's how he that's how he do it that size anyway. And that's how he defends the pick and roll yep. with the big hedge. And and Mac was so athletic he could get back to the basket. And there was you know yeah. Davion Bradford can't defend that way. Mm-hmm. He doesn't move nope. well enough. Exactly. So now they defend a little bit differently because they know Davion can't yep. do that. And, I mean, since we're talking about defense, I mean, I'm sure we're coming up to the end of this podcast. Yeah. You know, their defense, that's one thing that's where that they, happened. That's, that's where the season turned. Exactly. And Celta Miguel stepped Celta up as Miguel a ball became, stopper. Celta became the on-ball defender that Barry Brown was. Yep. Not saying he's as good as Barry Brown, but he took that role. He took exactly. that defensive role. He took that defensive responsibility. And he was really good at it. And mm-hmm. he's only going to get better. So that's something to really be excited about. And that's not necessarily what we were expecting out of Celta no. as a prospect. We knew he'd be great at attacking the rim, and he's shown that. Um, and we, and we, we knew he had um, a lot of potential on the defense, but he didn't show any of that in high school. No. But not many he's do. He's skilled offensively. Yes. He needs to shoot better. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the one thing. Because that's the one thing. is Out of high school, he shot pretty well, but the, now this in year college he hasn't, but his yeah. defense is made and, up and some of that. The only thing he could really do effectively this year on offense was attack the rim. Yep. And, facilitate and turn, and, turn, and turn the ball over. He turned the ball over. <laughs> but my over. thing is, is like teams are going to jump on that. They're going to sit on that, and they're going to realize if he can't knock down shots, and he didn't this year really, it's, he's not going to have a whole lot of space in the lane to make those drives either. So his most important attribute in the offseason to really build on is to be a little bit a more efficient shooter because if he doesn't, he's not going to be as an effective yep. at getting to the rim because it's going to be easy yep. to defend. His his work all has to be on the offensive yeah. end. His defense is fine. He needs to work on his ball handling, which isn't bad right now, but that can get better. And, yeah, his shooting, like you said. And De- Dejuan's probably the same way. Well, Cause that's the thing. Is a lot of this team, besides Nigel, everyone needs to work on But Dejuan shooting. and Selton are so similar. Yeah, no, they are. Dejuan, probably a little bit more of an effort, a little bit more of a motor, better rebounder. Selton, not as willing a rebounder, but Dejuan. But Selton's a better playmaker, yeah. even as a freshman. De- yeah, right? Selton's a better playmaker, better with the ball in his mm-hmm. hands. You're not going to let Dejuan take the ball, obviously. Yeah. But Dejuan needs to also shoot better, or he becomes – and teams are teams picked up on it. If You don't really have to guard Dejuan no, either because don't. he can't knock down shots. What's he, you know, Here, Dejuan's best ability to score, probably second chance points. That I mean, he's good at attacking the basket, but but you could take that away. Yeah, you because can. you can't. You don't have to. You don't have to honor a shot. Yep. No, you're right. You're right. You can. You can sag off him as much as you want. Um, and that, that's and that's what's made. Yeah, that's, that's what's the, made. And that's the issue with worse. playing Dejuan and Selton together is because you could sag off both. Yeah. 
You can't that's because problematic. they're not hitting. They're not hitting their shots. One of them needs to really pick it up as a shooter. And that's why this off season, I, I've I, I wrote about it recently. I believe that needs to be the biggest point of emphasis this mm-hmm. off season is shooting. I mean, because it's because even Mike McGraw yeah. can get better at shooting. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and you're going to need and want to play Dejuan and Selton together. Right now, it's kind of tough to do that. Yeah, it is. It is because you really that that's where, and that's what they've been doing, especially and, without. But, that, but that's where your scoring droughts come in at yep. because both of them are so limited on the offensive end right now. Nigel not limited on on the offensive end. We're still recapping the season, so we'll just go through it. But problematic as a defender. But he picked that up, realized how hard he had to play on the defensive end, and we saw a little bit of a change. He's not ever going to be a great defender just no. because of his size and the way he moves. But when he learned how hard he had to play on defense, mm-hmm. it just got better. Plus, he's still learning principles, too. He learns that more, becomes more comfortable with that. He's going to become a better defender just by knowing where to go and when to go. Mm-hmm. But um, I guess for me with Nigel, he, he he's a good shooter, but a little streaky. So maybe just become a little bit more consistent with the shot because mm-hmm. he'll make like 10 in a row and then miss 20 in a row. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of the way he went. Great ball handler. Very skilled in the offensive end. I guess for Nigel, what I would almost want is to almost just work on your physical attributes and your athleticism. If you can get a a tick quicker or a tick more athletic, I think you become a different player if you're Nigel Pack. I think that's a a great point because I think his shooting, I I don't think he needs to work much on his shooting. His ball handling is great. Everything as a point guard you want him to have, you would like him Mm -hmm. to work on his physicals a little bit, get a little bit bigger if he can. Um, stronger in the weight room and I think that probably is going to be his main area of focus because that will only help his defense too mm-hmm. is the stronger he gets um, but yeah like you said he'll never be good on defense but his offense is exciting and the reason he's streaky to me is because they don't have another guy that can shoot the ball. Oh, okay so he's ta- so, he, so he was taking some shots that he probably shouldn't exactly take. and he's asked to take the shots which he should he gets open mm-hmm. and he takes them and they just miss uh, but man he would get even more open if they had another guy that could shoot it consistently. Okay, back to the TCU game. We'll finish there. What do they need? What's the top thing they need to do well to pull out the win? I would say just stick with the defense because yeah. T- TCU's they're not really going to defend you all that well anyway. So you're going to get your points. Kansas State not really an offensive team, but they'll probably get theirs against TCU. If they can hold TCU under 60, which I don't think is crazy to suggest, That's what they did last time. That's what 54. they did last time. You hold them under 60, I think you win. I agree. I think defense is where they've they've made their bread and butter the last. Uh, three, three, or yeah, three of the last four wins, including the last month, the defense has gotten better. the The only game where defense has not been good was that game I mentioned earlier against Texas, where they still lost by only three because that was their best offensive performance all season. So yes, it's going to have to ride on the defense because you can't expect this offense to be a juggernaut. Um, so that's really where they're going to have to, to, you know, do their work. Uh, and Selton, he did it. He did it the last time against them. He he locked up R.J. Nembhard. He's mm-hmm. not the most talented player, so it's. I think that's something K State and Selton Miguel can do again. All right, we'll wrap it up. We got a win from Flando. Yep. I think I got a win. And then for... they beat Baylor, and then they beat. Oh, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's funny the women play TC as well, and if they and win, they Baylor. play. And then they play Baylor as well. So you know, K State's going to lose to Baylor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Flato's got a win over the Frogs. I got a win over the Frogs. Then I got a loss after the Frogs. Hang the banner. Hang the. I'm no. just kidding. They're not going to beat the Baylor Bears, All right. unfortunately. What, what do we do? Tell your friends. 